right? Absolutely. Yeah. I like what you said, because I don't think of it as being a cost. I think of it as a temporary loss of liquidity. That million dollar death benefit, you just reserved your spot in line for a million dollars. You won't get it tomorrow, but you'll get it eventually. You or your family will get that money eventually. There's nothing, you know, we can't just, we should not ignore the death benefit. And I find that uh, people who are good candidates, good clients for infinite banking, they appreciate the value of that permanent death benefit. They don't say, oh, no, I lost money. They're like, no, I purchased a death benefit, right? That death benefit is where everything flows from. All the benefits of infinite banking and whole life insurance ultimately flow from that permanent death benefit. Why, why does whole life insurance grow cash value? Because a future payment has a present value. The future payment is that death benefit, which is guaranteed. Cash value is simply the net present value of that future death benefit, right? There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's yeah, basically it, what again, it is, Yeah, right? again, these are, these are concepts. I'm, I'm totally tracking with what you're saying, and it's 100% accurate. Again, I've found when I talk to clients, uh, you tend to lose all but the most. <laughs> right, right, right. But, yeah, but yeah. to put it in simple terms, a whole life policy is a contract that says your cash value has to equal the death benefit by either life expectancy when you actually die or by age 120, 121. And so most of us aren't going to get there. Who knows? Maybe some of my kids or their kids will actually live to 120 or 121. But if you plot that out as a compound curve, that's exactly what it looks like. The cash value or your equity in the death benefit that you can actually use it grows like a compound curve and you capture most of that by life expectancy. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so the thing about life, since it is a life insurance product, even if you died early, right, the cash value then all of a sudden has to equal the death benefit just because that's what the contract says. If you don't die early, well, your equity, your cash value grows towards this death benefit, like reverse gravity. And it's a contract. It has to happen. It's hard coded in the policy. And this is why we model out different policies to show people, you know, they call whole life a black box, but each company has their own curve, how that's supposed to happen. And as you overfund, maybe you've heard of overfunding into whole life or paid up additions. When you pay this extra money into life insurance, you're just accelerating that curve. But once it's in there, it all has to grow on this hard-coded curve that gets closer and closer to the death benefit every year. Logan said, it's the net present value of the future death benefit. That's one way of putting it. That's absolutely true. Another way to say it is your equity, what you can actually use today of that future death benefit will continue to grow on this hard-coded curve. Right. The longer you're in the contract and the more money you put in. Right. The real estate analogy, I think, makes sense to people. They think you can think of it like paying money into a real estate property where there's the total value of the house. That's the death benefit. Then there's your equity in the house, which grows over time. That's the cash value. Then you can borrow against that house. That would be the policy loan. Plus, you're collecting rental income. That's the dividend, except we're rein reinvesting, I say in quotes, that dividend. There's the also the, the guaranteed interest, which you could just say is just the overall appreciation of real estate over time. Right. But that in a right. policy, there's two parts. You do get dividends and these mm -hmm. are declared annually and they do they will fluctuate depending on usually prevailing interest rates is the biggest driver. There are other factors, how profitable the company is, how well they manage their expenses. But there's also the hard coded just, you know, real estate will probably appreciate. Whole life will guarantee to appreciate every year. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about some of the either, you know, success stories, use cases. What have you seen with you personally or your clients where they've been able to, you know, where this has been a game changer for them? Yeah. You know, it's a game changer is a strong word. And obviously we take confidentiality very seriously, but I think, you know, the people that seem to get it the most and the, to make the best use of it are usually the real estate investors and the entrepreneurs and just seeing them employ it in their own endeavors. Like they're usually already, I don't want to say game changer because they're already very successful people. They're very ambitious. Mm -hmm. I don't like the word driven because that entails that like something else is driving them, but they're just, they're self-starters. They're very ambitious. They they don't have the bulk of their wealth in the stock market anyway, because they, they can't understand it. They can't control it. It's too volatile. Um, and so they can't depend on it. And usually they have some very successful ventures 
Again, whether that's real estate or that's their own business or multiple businesses. And then they have a lot of liquidity in traditional banks because that's the only place they can count on it to be safe and liquid when they need it the most. And so again, they're more concerned, the old Will Rogers or whoever said that, Mark Twain, some people say, nobody knows who said it. They're more concerned about the return of their principal than the return on their principal uh, because they it, they know they're going to be able to turn that money and make astronomical rate of returns. And so they just need to know that it's safe and liquid whenever that opportunity comes. And so game changer is a strong word because they're already they're the types of people that are already changing their game. And quite frankly, if they never met us, they were going to do fine. But right, they've right. they've been able to create this whole other profit center in their life. Yeah, and to, yeah. to essentially turbocharge their liquidity, not right. to mention bolt on this additional these additional benefits, because whenever you're dealing with these types of people, like the biggest asset in their world is themselves. Like they are yep. the biggest drivers, and now they may have some term insurance. A lot of them don't because they've built enough assets. But simply by moving money from one pocket to another pocket and using life insurance as their own bank. Now we've actually created a very large amount of death benefit, almost as we're not allowed to say free life insurance, but almost as a ride along mm -hmm. by turbocharging their savings. And mm -hmm. so it really just creating this extra efficiency, which they all seem to love life insurance, or excuse me, entrepreneurs and real estate investors, you know, they'll show us their spreadsheets and they have everything kind of <laughs> plotted out to the penny. So what they didn't realize is there's this whole other tab <laughs> right, right. On their right. spreadsheet that they weren't using. That's um, a great way of saying it. It's what what is seen versus what is unseen, right? Yeah. The things that we can see and measure tend to improve. We tend to manage those pretty well. It's the things that we cannot see, like opportunity cost, that tend to sort of tend to go away, right? Because we don't see it. So I actually like the fact, I talk, talked about this with Peter Nelson a in another episode, and he liked it when I talked about the fact that a policy loan charges interest is a good thing because what it's doing is it's turning in what is what is a, an oftentimes invisible cost, opportunity cost, into a visible cost. So if I pay cash, I don't see what I could have earned on that cash sure. had I saved it. I don't see that. Yeah. But when I borrow against my policy, I can see the interest of being charged on my policy loan, which is good because now I can manage that. I can measure it and I can manage it, right? No, that's great. Uh, going back to uh, Don Blanton, who we talked about earlier, who made the uh, private reserve strategy software, he actually opened up the module with, uh, I, forget the, I forget the term, but essentially in corporate finance, is this opportunity cost you're talking about is they they weren't when they were using cash or deploying cash the company itself and i think it was coca-cola was the one that came up with it wasn't charging themselves interest or wasn't attributing an opportunity cost or an interest rate to the use of that cash and they realized that once they did and started kind of lending the money to their subsidiaries or different departments they were a lot more accountable to how efficiently it was being used. And so that's what I hear you saying, Logan, when people pay cash for things, and I'm the same way, right? It's kind of gone, it's spent, it's, and, 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 and there's no attribution and there's no accountability there. But nowadays, I keep very little cash around and I have lots of different places I, I use loans. So not only with life insurance, but I actually like to have optionality in my different loan options. And so when I make my force myself to take a loan for whether it's spending or adding another family vehicle or making a business decision or making investments, I am a lot more mentally, I'm a lot more accountable because money is being charged for the use of this money. But to your point, even if not, it should be. And they found that this company was I believe it was Coca Cola in the example, and I'll have to I'll have to look up what that was. Uh, but the company was so much more successful, and then it actually became a theme in corporate finance uh, when they deployed their cash reserves with this accountability. Yeah, I believe they call that economic value added or something. That's like that. it, EVA. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and yes. I believe that's in I believe that's in Nelson Nash's book too, becoming your own banker, because it's an important concept to understand relevant to. Uh, infinite banking. That's why I like what you said earlier that it's not necessarily about positive arbitrage, right? 
just because I might be paying a higher interest rate on a policy loan than what I'm earning in the policy. That doesn't mean I'm losing because that interest I'm paying on the policy is interest I was going to pay anyway. So, right? so let's talk about that for a little bit, because I, I understand that like some of our competitors or whatnot said, it's not about positive arbitrage at all. And I agree with you. It, it shouldn't be the end all be all, but it's very nice when you can get it. <laughs> sure, sure, and, sure. And, and, and I will and, say and, this. And, and you will get positive arbitrage in terms of volume, not necessarily in rate. If you're managing, doing things responsibly, right? You will get positive arbitrage. That doesn't necessarily mean that if you just compare two numbers, what am I earning in the policy versus what interest rate I'm being charged on the policy loan, right? You won't necessarily get positive arbitrage in that sense. But in terms but you, of volume. But you can. Right? So a but lot you of can, times absolutely. not. You're yeah, not yeah. in this moment. And I think it's really important that we bring this up, Logan, because I find that people in general and consumers, what they do is they look at what's right in front of their face right now, and they kind of hard code that as permanent. So mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. like people right now are like, well, why would I do a, a life insurance policy that only pays me five something percent when I get the same thing in a bank with no costs and there's no minimum payment. And then like, it's just easy and I can do whatever. It's amazing how quickly these people forget, like for the last decade and a half, their rate of return that they got from a bank started with a point. It started with a dot. But they're talking about now, like it's just, it's always been here and it always will be here. Right, right. right. Imagine if people the thought, is, <laughs> thought there'd be 0% uh, interest rates forever, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that talk was going around. So you're right, at this moment in time, the loan rate on a policy is increment is slightly higher than what the policy itself is earning if you look at it in a vacuum. Mm. But actually, a lot of my clients, you talked about success stories. So we were one of the first uh, companies to certainly public uh, publicly say that you should use these outside lines of credit. I actually adopted one myself and recommended to my clients when there was only one bank. It was Valley Bank at the time. It's an East Coast bank. A lot of people seen them where they actually had a turnkey cash value line of credit program. Still in business today, um, but now there's several competitors where essentially it's like there's a HELOC, right? Uh, there's home equity lines of credits. There actually are cash value lines of credits or CV locks or some, some of them call I blocks insurance, insurance backed lines of credits where you can pledge the policy as collateral and get a loan from a traditional bank. Now those rates are even higher than the policy loan right now. I've actually recommended that a lot of my clients refinance those uh, cash value lines of credits to back to the policy loan. But for the better part of the last decade and change, we were getting lower rates from these banks than policy ro loans by the by the magnitude of two to two and a half percent to where now all of a sudden you were earning five, five and a half, and your loan rate was three and a half, three, some very high net worth policyholders with seven figure cash value balances were paying two and three quarters, two and a half. So now yeah. all of a sudden you project that positive arbitrage for mm -hmm. five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's a number. And yeah. that's something we definitely want. That's good work if you can get it. Mm -hmm. um, and during these times where you're not and you're getting equal arbitrage or slight negative arbitrage, you can afford to fade that knowing that there will be opportunities, whether it's times or combining other assets and other loan types, like we've recently talked about in our 4D banking webinar. Uh, you can go to, we actually made a site, 4D, like number four, not 40 like the number, number four, letter D, banking.com. And we actually made a webinar showing how I personally, my partner, Ben, how some of our most successful clients pair actually other accounts with infinite banking to, to look for opportunities for positive arbitrage, to give you more optionality, to give you more flexibility. And for clients that want it to the ability to earn better rates of return uh, with market-based investments, whether it be an actual stock market portfolio, or and I realize this is a dirty word with a lot of infinite bankers are using infinite bank or excuse me, index universal life policies not as the core, but as an ancillary, as another layer to have the potential to earn better rates of return, but also have more optionality on the loan side. So something we're checking out. Um, I don't know if you want to 
you talked, you wanted to talk a little bit about velocity banking, which is kind of the world yeah. you came from. If you want to share with us a little bit about that. Well, we, yeah, I mean, uh, boy, that's a whole nother can of worms, but I love the word that you used optionality. Mm -hmm. So um, I think velocity banking has many of the same principles as infinite banking, but velocity banking um, is really a way of funneling your cash flow through something through a, a debt instrument rather than through a checking account. So as an example, I am an ambassador for the first lien HELOC program where you can buy a house or refinance your mortgage into a first lien home equity line of credit. They give you a checking account that's automatically linked to your HELOC. And so now your cash flow is going through your home equity rather than through a checking account that doesn't really give you any benefits, right? A checking account is just kind of a, a holding tank. Now, the typical use case you'll see for velocity banking is that it's a much more efficient way of paying off debt, which is true, which is true, right? You can pay off your house a lot faster if you have good cash flow. You can also refinance other higher interest debts into your HELOC and pay them down, right? Where things get really powerful is when you combine velocity banking with infinite banking, mm -hmm. right? So over time, you have two pools of liquidity. You have a pool of liquidity in home equity, and you have a pool of liquidity in cash value life insurance, both of which you can borrow against or utilize with very favorable terms, right? And you have control, right? Uh, you have control over both. And so... Um, that's a strategy which someone in the business calls infinite velocity. Uh, but, but basically, you are combining those two complementary strategies into an overall cash flow machine, if you will, so that instead of having this thing called a checking account, which when you ask people, what's your cash flow management strategy? They kind of look at you like, what are you talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you have one. It's called a checking account, right? That, that's really your cash flow management strategy is you give all your money over to the bank before you do anything with it and everything goes through that. What if we could just funnel your cash flow through a more efficient vehicle so you could realize a lot of benefits without changing anything you're doing, without changing anything you're doing, right? Hey, so uh, I, I'm just going to put it out there. I think, I think we should do a whole separate episode just on this. And uh, yes. I'll, I'll have you know, I just got an email on the way here that my HELOC was just approved. Excellent. So yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Is it a first lien HELOC or is it just a standard HELOC? I, I, don't, I don't know the difference, uh, to be honest with you. Okay. So, well, then it's not, it's probably not the specialized product, but a HELOC is still, you can still do velocity banking with a standard HELOC. Yeah. 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 So it got really good uh, rates and terms and flexibility. And it's just, it's just basically a line of credit. Like, a, like I, I need to go, I'm, I have some plans to start using it, but, um, excellent. But, excellent. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I'd love to pick your brain on this uh, too a little bit. But yeah, long story short is we bought a house during COVID. Um, you know, obviously I have no interest, excuse me, interest is probably the wrong word. That's going to be confusing. <laughs> I have no desire to, to rapidly pay down something in the low threes. I meant to refinance it in the high to mid twos and was just so busy. I didn't have time to because the process of, for going through that is just so brutal. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but anyway, I, so I have a 30 year mortgage locked in low threes, obviously, uh, the house appreciated in value, uh, love the house, uh, and, and realize I have all this equity trapped inside there. And even though mm -hmm. I don't have plans per se to use it right now, I, I do for sense, I do, I do foresee, uh, asset values coming down <laughs> in the, in the <laughs> near to midterm futures. Uh, for things. And so I wanted to get, I wanted to get the HELOC taken out because I had a HELOC in 2008 and 2009 and I had a little balance on it. I was current and I had no reason for them to take it away. But when, when asset values came down, they took it away. And so I wanted to be able to like, when, when there's canaries in the coal mine and, and the cracks in the dam start to reveal themselves, I'm just going to max pull from that. So I have the money available, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, pump it through life insurance policies if I have to or whatever and and uh, deploy that into depressed asset values, whether that be real estate or the stock market or some combination thereof uh, when when uh, uh, for any number of reasons <laughs> in yeah, the near future. Um, it's just, a, I, oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent strategy. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to circle back because you talked about, um, you talked about uh, success stories with my clients and you also 
mentioned uh, my use of the word optionality. So the third class of people we really help uh, are just fiscally responsible savers. And it was actually one of my clients who really turned me on to that word. So uh, him and his wife are both, uh, they both work for hedge funds. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they both work for, um, you know, they're, they're financial people, right? On the buy side, which means, you know, they're trading institutional money. And um, the reason I use them is because they're already, they're already so correlated to the stock market in their own, in their jobs, so to speak, you know, their bonuses mm -hmm. and everything else, just the existence of their jobs. And so they really wanted a place that was, again, safe, liquid, making a decent rate of return. Uh, but they didn't, they weren't necessarily funneling it through their own business. They weren't funneling it through real estate right away, but they, they did want to have the option to make some moves, but just wanted it to, you know, be safe, liquid, but earning a nice rate of return. And we have a lot of clients like that, that I call them just above average Joes, right? That, it, and I think you said that that's really the the crux of your market, right? You're not doing it's it's more of a yeah, it's more of a mindset than it is like a wealth level. I think a lot of average people can do infinite banking. It's not for millionaire real estate investors or entrepreneurs exclusively. Um, I find though that the people who have the right mindset, they kind of tend to be improving financially all the time, and they probably yes. will will get there eventually. Uh, but yeah, I love, man, you don't have to oversell this stuff. Just the vanilla use case is really, really good. Yeah. It's and so really I think good. for most people, like I, like we have one, uh, one client say like, you know, I'm not looking to become like an infinite banking mega landlord and, you know, like, <laughs> but really, you know, the people do have emergency funds, right? Mm -hmm. They, they are suspicious of valuations in the stock market. They are suspicious of valuations in the real estate real estate market. They don't necessarily want to deploy money right now, but mm -hmm. they don't want it sitting dead in taxable bank accounts. Uh, you know, and so they they want to have a place to put it that's safe, liquid, still growing. And mm -hmm. once they learn that, hey, it's not just about that linear rate of return, but now if you funnel enough money through here, right, even if you're not going to do everything, you get this whole other dimensionality, you know, and now you can put money to work that was normally just passing through your hands, but you can funnel it through this system. Um, those are those are a lot of our clients, right? And those are yeah. a lot of our clients. And it it's not necessarily, it, it's more of a, a not yet thing. Like I'm not saying no to do, being my own business owner someday. I'm not saying no to investing in real estate. I'm just saying not yet. And, and, the, and infinite banking is a great place for them. But anyway, I was... He, the, the, the gentleman that I'm thinking of used the word optionality when we were talking about his own situation. And that really mm -hmm. stuck with me. And yep. he says, oh, we use that word all the time when we're making investments with institutional money, you know, like there's, there's optionality in this play and whatever else. And so that's, that's worth something of value right there. Just having the optionality. Um, yeah. And it, it's amazing how it changes your mindset for the better when you have this asset that you know is always growing, it makes it easier to be disciplined about not chasing after the shiny object because you don't need the shiny object. You have 100%. this safe place where your money's growing tax-free. You don't have to worry about it. And so you're going to be more disciplined about, let me pick an actual real opportunity, yep. right? And, and a real opportunity is subjective, right? There are lots of great opportunities out there, but what's the one that suits your investor DNA, as they say, right? Real estate. Yeah, we, we have a lot maybe, of clients. Maybe it's that not do, for you, uh, right? We yeah. have we have clients do the private money lending. And uh I, I'll admit I have I haven't I haven't done that yet. I am looking into it now. Uh, yeah. I am looking into some <laughs> of these options. But one of the reasons I haven't was because of the math problem that you said. It's like, you know, if I can if I can get 10% doing private money lending, even if it's collateralized, but there's like a process that's possibly legal and complicated to, if somebody isn't paying to like actually acquire the asset right that is collateralizing mm -hmm. it if i'm earning 10 percent taxable in my bracket that's like that's basically what i'm earning tax-free in my life insurance <laughs> i'm like well, why am i going to go through the complication right the uh, discount but, rate you got to you got to discount everything right yeah. because i know i can earn this amount and I don't have to worry about it. that's the the risk free rate of return, if you will. Hmm. So, how much do I need to be compensated 
for, for that extra risk premium. And I think that number tends to go up as you do whole life insurance, like making 8% in the stock market all of a sudden isn't so attractive when I can earn, you know, let's just say 4% tax-free, risk-free inside of whole life. You know, I mean, that other four points is not really going to do it for me. You know, it's not worth the risk, right? Plus, it's all about cash flow. It's not about rate of return. I don't want to park my money somewhere and earn a return. I want to create cash flow, right? Like I assume your best investment is your business. That's what's creating the income. That's what's creating the income, right? So uh, so now if I can get an additional return on top of that with some of my working capital, great, right? But ultimately I just, I want income, right? It's all about creating multiple streets of streams of income, right? That that's true. I will say this. So I, I at some point I may end up making an info course uh, on this. But one of the things I do with with stocks, whether they be in a retirement account or whether they be just in a margin account, is I do create cash flow using options. Yeah. So yeah. By yep, selling yep. covered calls yep. or when there's stocks that I want to buy and I have a I have a shopping list when there's stocks that I want to own, but maybe they're not at the level I want to own them at now. By promising to buy them lower, it's something called a cash secured put or sometimes a naked put using margin. Mm -hmm. I can actually create very attractive rates of return and cash flow by using these contracts and these promises. And so I actually have a, you talked about success stories. I have a successful client who he works, he actually works for a major corporate industry. He has become a mega infinite banking landlord and he has these retirement accounts and everything else, and then got involved uh, with selling cat or excuse me, selling covered calls on stocks and was showing me one day on his spreadsheets. Like to me, this is just a rental property. Like this kind of yeah. company I don't anyway, and I'm happy to own it. And mm -hmm. every week, every month, I'm just generate all this cash flow. I don't really care about the level of where it's at. Just like with my properties, I don't go check on Zillow what they're worth all the time because they're generating cash flows. And he goes, I did the same thing. So again, that's probably beyond the scope of this uh, call. But I think, especially within the infinite banking community, I think the stock market does get vilified. And, and let's, let's face it, there is a lot of manipulation on Wall Street and everything else. But if you stick to that model of, hey, there may be certain companies, because the stock market, all you're doing is buying businesses. So like, it's interesting to me that entrepreneurs uh, shy away from the stock market. And it just has to do with like lack of control and lack of understanding. But if you right. boil it down to the core, really what you're doing is you're buying businesses. That's what Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett said. You're just, you, they don't buy stocks, they buy businesses that they want to own forever. And so if you stuck to the that small subset of companies, whatever that is for you, I think there's value to following your dollar to things that you understand, businesses you understand, businesses you patronize. For instance, I'm a stockholder in Zoom. This is not a recommendation. They have hash on their balance sheet, <laughs> right? Uh, it's no longer the COVID darling, but they've fallen from grace. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a business I use every day. It's a business I believe in. There are competitors. There are reasons why it can fall. There is risk. Uh, but because of its own volatility, uh, there is an opportunity. I have been paid to, to sell covered calls, which this just means I promise to sell at a price higher than where it is now. And when I, the reason I own the Zoom shares I have is because it was falling. And I said, if it, people say this, if it keeps falling, I'll buy it. Well, I just put my money where my mouth is by saying like, you know, if it gets to this number, I'll buy some. If I promise that a week to a month in advance, somebody will actually give me money. And right. if I was going to buy it anyway, uh, and when you, when you plot out those rates of return, you can earn anywhere from this sounds crazy. And you, you have to do take a lot of risk to earn this, but you could earn 1% a week, not recommending that. Being very, very conservative, you can earn one to two percent a month. So again, not plugging that, but this is something I do in my own life that I think does deserve a seat at the table for a certain, like you said, investor, for somebody with a certain investor DNA, because of what it is, like you're just if you're just buying businesses you believe in and you do believe in cash flow. This is an opportunity that I think is missed by a lot of a, a lot of people, especially in the infinite banking community, because they're just throwing out the baby with the bathwater with Wall Street manipulation, if you will. Right. I always say, look, if you're if you're going to play in the stock market, you need to have some kind of option strategy. Otherwise, 
just go do something else, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, so yeah, options I, can be great if you know what you're doing, but it's just like anything else, right? If you're willing to put in the time and the effort to research it and really learn it, you can probably be successful with it. You can probably be successful with it. The challenge is, to your point, so many people, maybe they, they don't even buy individual companies. They just put their money in, quote, unquote, the market, and they have yeah. no idea what they're doing, and they have no idea why. They're just doing it because they were told to do it, right? Yeah. You know. So one one of the one of the people I follow, uh, he had a great saying the other day. He said, um, he said, date because I think when people hear it, they think of day trading stocks and it's going to take a long time. I don't put that much time. In. I put like maybe a few minutes a day and like one day a week. I might put in a good maybe half hour to forty minutes. He said, day trading stocks is like a job. Doing options on stocks you want to own anyway is like a business. Right. Where it's like, it doesn't consume a lot of my time. And yes, but like my ultimate risk is I will end up having to pay money for a company I said I wanted to own anyway, a business I wanted to own a piece of anyway. That's on the cash secure put side. And on the covered call side, my max risk is I sell my company that I wanted to own for a profit, but I don't make as much as I would have made if I just held on to it. That's it. Those are my max right. risks with those two strategies. And, and it's something that takes very little of my time. At some point, like I said, I may end up coming with an info course, but I, I digress. This is beyond the scope of this call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, man, we could talk all day, man. Uh, so, Hutch, it was great to have you on the show. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. We get to talk to one of the greats today. Uh, anything you want to leave our audience with in closing? Oh gosh, what do I want to, you know, I, I'm just really excited. I, I'd like to do that follow-up call with you about the uh, infinite velocity. That's cool. I don't know who coined that, but that's, that's a cool thing. I think there's, that's definitely where we're going as a company again, with that 40 banking.com, not 40, like the number 4D, like four dimensions banking, 40 banking.com as a company, we're really um, trying to educate clients that it's beyond just kind of like, I think people can think of infinite banking as this gimmicky life insurance sales thing, but it's not, it's a system, it's a process. And, and life insurance absolutely should be the foundation because it's the most safe, dependable, and you're able to take more risks, whether that's in your investments or able to, able to add in other dimensions of infinite banking, as long as that is the core underpinning of your strategy. Uh, but I'm really, really interested in in also talking about like layering in more velocity banking to this all because that's just a massive opportunity for people that are trying to squeeze more efficiency out of their cash flow. That for all of us is limited to some degree. Again, we can only save 10 to 30 percent, maybe. But what do we do with that extra 70 to 90 percent? Or how do we get more more predictable cash flow stacking off that 10 to 30? than just doing traditional investing. Absolutely, absolutely. That is something we're definitely going to be talking about in the future. I look and we'll we'll do a series of videos on it. But Hutch, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Everyone, this is Logan. Been Hutch thanks for having me. With Banking Trues, we'll include some links to his stuff in the description below. Hutch, thanks again. Great to see you, my friend.